begin a new month, a month that we have never seen before. We just thank God excuse me, for what he's doing in this season. And so this month, I wanted to take some time and reflect on a particular thought with everybody. You know, we talk a lot about praying and, you know, the power of prayer. We understand that prayer is our communication with the Father. But so many times, life gets us into such a place and circumstance that our lives will try to tell us that we're not worthy to pray or that we don't know how we ought to pray. So today and in this month, I want to do my best to come against those ideas and those attitudes so that we can all be reminded that prayer is our conversation with the Father. But now that we understand, because it's all about building blocks and putting pieces together and growing in things and learning things, but we have to have a firm foundation in that which we're trying to build upon, that which we're trying to learn, in that place which we're trying to go. We know that Christ is our firm foundation, correct? Amen. So since he's our firm foundation, I also want us to have some knowledge to back it up. And it's not that we don't know these things, but sometimes we need to bring things into our remembrance so we can boldly stand upon those things. Praying. Something so simple. You know, we were taught it as small children, probably by our parents or our grandparents, but I think we get to a point in life where we begin to take it for granted. Life will tell you that the, life, the world we live in today is very process driven. It tells you that the only way to get to this is if you do this. There's prerequisites for school. There's prereqs for everything that we try to do. Gotta get, gotta get, gotta get. Now there are some prerequisites in our relationship with Christ, but we must also understand that to have that relationship, there's an open invitation to whosoever will. Amen. And the reason that he did it this way is so that and that's the kind of God we serve. Many, many years ago when these ordinances were given, he made them in such a simple form that no matter what the world tries to tell us, there's a simplicity in Jesus. Yes. Whosoever will. Whosoever. Now there's an outline for prayer. There's a model. There's some things you want to cover in prayer. But before we get there, he told us whosoever will. Yeah. He didn't ask, he didn't say that you've got to reach this level of maturity in your life and this level of maturity in your relationship with him. Whosoever will, wherever you are, whatever you're going through, whatever you're facing, whoever's told you different, whoever's told you contrary, no matter what your mind has told you, no matter what you're feeling in this moment, whosoever will. Yeah. So if we lay that foundation of whosoever will, we've got to know who we're praying to and what we're expecting and what power and authority he has given to us. Yes. We refer to Jesus, to the book, to God as our father, okay? We know that he's our father, but he's not just a father. He is our father. We all, every last one of us, have a commonality. We all have an earthly father. You would not be here if you did not. So that's a father. Now, everyone's relationship with their father is different. So we're not going to focus on our earthly father. We're going to focus on our heavenly father because everyone's relationship with our heavenly father is the same. He died, he sent his son, and his son died for us. He's there and he's reaching back to us. He gave us a comforter that is going to be with us until he returns. So not a father when we think of in the natural, but our father that we think of in the spirit. Amen? If we were to boldly come to the throne of grace to receive help in our time of need, we must understand who sits on the throne. When we're praying, don't let your prayer just be prayer and words that you're saying and you know things that you are professing, but understand who he is, understand where he is, and understand the power that he has. We must know who God is, and we also must know what kind of person he is. Know for yourself. Amen. And the reason that you have to know for yourself is because the world is going to be contrary. Your friends are going to be contrary. Make a change in your life for the better. 
Yeah. And those that ride with you and rode with you in everything you did before that moment, you understand just who is in your corner. Mm -hmm. You might have started out with 15, but make a change for Jesus, and your circle is going to dwindle. He had 12, but there were three in the inner circle. But in the last hour, how many were standing with him? So you got to know who he is for yourself. And the reason you know for yourself is so that when people give you things that are contrary and contradicting, you can say, but I know for myself. I know who he is, and I know that he sits on the throne, okay? We learn much by considering our Lord's most basic instructions that he has given us in prayer. It's not a quadratic equation. It does not take a PhD to understand. You do not have to defend this thesis. He gives us simple and basic instruction, okay? Now, what we commonly refer to, my grandma would say the Our Father Prayer, but many of us say the Lord's Prayer. When we refer to this, it contains some of the most profound thoughts on prayer found in all the Bible. Every word in the most profound thoughts in prayer when we get to this point, we understand that this is the model of prayer, and this model is very important, okay? The same model is given again in Luke's gospel in response to a specific request from the disciples concerning prayer. Because the disciples got to a place where they felt an inadequacy in prayer, and they wanted Jesus' aid. Then he responded by giving them this beautiful pattern to follow. We, too, can be like the disciples. We can feel inadequate. How many times... Have you gone somewhere and you heard someone get up to pray and it sounded so eloquent and it sounded so thought-provoking and it sounded like the most poetic thing you had ever heard and then you say to yourself, I can't pray like that, so I'm not going to pray. That is not what the Father wants us to do. This is why you've got to know for yourself. Okay, it doesn't matter how eloquent it sounds. What matters is the relationship that you have with him. It may take some people, you know, to exegete a text to get into his presence. But I'm one that can just say, Father, help me. Amen. Father, I need you. Amen. Father, I messed up and I don't know what to do. Father, fight for me. Sometimes you might just be able to clap your hands. Sometimes you might just be able to cry and, and hum a tune. But whatever it is that you need to do, he gave basic instruction yes. in prayer. Amen. And he made it basic so that we can all understand I am a whosoever and here are the basic instructions that he has given me to be able to pray and get into his presence, okay? Now all of us have experienced those beautiful moments and then there's a person Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones who contends that prayer is at the, the Lord's Prayer is actually an outline for prayer. This outline for prayer that is given is similar to the outline that I and many other pastors use uh, when it comes to preparing a service. There's a, a, a sermon. There's an order and there's a way. And even in the Lord's Prayer, he gives us this order and this way. Okay? And the way we look at the, the Lord's Prayer is divided into two major sections, okay? And there are two major concerns that we present to the Father in prayer. In the first concern, within the first three petitions, it is related to God's glory. Because when we begin to pray, I know we got a lot in our hearts. I know we got a lot on our minds. I know we got a lot that we want to lay at his feet. But we don't just want to be people that come into his presence to tell him what we need. Now, we're going to tell him what we need, because we need him, and we need him to help us get there. But before we get into that, in the beginning, we want to take that moment and be focused on his glory. Why are we going to focus first on his glory? Because that gives our mind a chance and a moment to focus and to calibrate. That's why, before we have church, any one of you that want to come out at 8.30, we have our intercessory, uh, intercessory prayer because we're praying to set the service and the day in order. So Because it, it has to begin with prayer. But we don't just come in and rush to God. God, we need, we need, we need. In the beginning, we focus on his glory. Okay? And the three things that we focus on with his glory is his name, his kingdom, and his will. It's not about us. Amen. There's power in his name. Use the name. At the sound of the name, demons tremble. This is things that we know. We want to focus on his kingdom. It's not about where we want to go. And it's not about what we want to do. 
It is all about his kingdom and kingdom business. And finally, we want to focus on his will because we might have a plan, but God has a purpose for each and every one of us. So his name, his kingdom, and his will. Then we move on to the last four areas, which are our need. It begins with him and it ends with us, okay? And this should always be our order of concern when we pray to the Father. We start off giving him the glory and we start off with, you know, doing what we need to do for him and then we venture into our need, okay? So first we get everything that we gather here gives us light in the order at which we will address our Father. And that is why it begins with our Father, which are in heaven. Because it's not about me. It's not about you. It's not about what I'm facing. It's not about what I'm going through. It is about our Father. Not my daddy. Not your daddy. But our Father. And we know that he's our Father. And we know that he is in heaven. Because we have to give a separation. Just in case the world is a little confused and the enemy is confused, I'm not talking to my daddy. I'm talking to my father, which art in heaven. Not just a father, but our father. Amen? Now let us stand for our scripture reading on today. We're going to be coming from the book of Matthew, chapter 6, verses 1 through 15. Amen. And the word of God reads as follows. Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets, to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. Then your father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not pray like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to the father who is unseen. Then your father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Amen. Gracious Father, we're here today, Heavenly Father, for your word, Heavenly Father. The scripture has been studied, Heavenly Father, but right now, Holy Spirit, speak to these, your people, Heavenly Father. You know the needs that are in the building, Father. And we're trusting you right now, Lord, in this moment, not just to meet the needs, but to exceed the needs because you are the God that changes not, Heavenly Father. Lord, take over the service, Heavenly Father, at this point, Heavenly Father. Let the building continue to be saturated, Lord, with your presence, Heavenly Father. We're trusting you right now in this moment, Heavenly Father, for a word. Heavenly Father, a word to confirm, a word to affirm, a word to equip, and a word to encourage. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Not a father, but our father. So we're going to lay some foundation so that we all understand who we're praying to, how we are to pray, and what we are to expect. The first thing that we've got to know is we must know that God is our father. Whose father is he? Whosoever will. God is the father of the millionaires. God is the father of the poor. God is the father of those that appear to be righteous. God is the father of those that are unrighteous. If you acknowledge him, God is our father, okay? There are a few scattered references to God as father in the Old Testament, but it was Jesus our Lord who really gave meaning to this address. 
of God as our Father. Jesus came from the bosom of the Father, speaking of God as Father in very personal terms. Know him for yourself. It's one thing to speak about something that we've read. I can speak about childbirth from things that I learned in biology my whole life, but I've never birthed a child. But someone that has birthed a child can give a perspective that my words can't even wrap around. I may know all the scientific terms. I may know all the days and the months and the gestation and all these things, but somebody that can stand up and say, I birthed a child, and I can tell you this feeling, and I can tell you this expectation, and I can tell you this, and I can tell you that, that it trumps any day what I have to say because I'm speaking what I've heard and she is speaking what she knows. Know the Father for yourself. And when you come into this type of relationship with him, you make it personal. And when things are personal, you can speak about him in a way that others may not be able to understand because you are speaking from a place of experience and your own understanding. Know what the word says, but also know him for yourself. Jesus came from his bosom, so when he spoke about him, he spoke in very personal terms because he knew, he understood, and he was in relationship, okay? So what we are admitting when we say our Father which art in heaven, we are affirming when we address God that he is our heavenly Father. Some may hear you say our Father, and they may think you have some siblings, and you're talking about Joe Brown that lives in Cummins. That's not what we're doing. When we say our Father, which art in heaven, we're talking about our Heavenly Father. We're giving him some distinction. It, many people know a Father, but how many of them know our Father? So you give him the distinction that is needed because you know who he is, and you know where he is, our Father, which art in heaven. When we make that statement, our Father, which art in heaven, we are referring to the resourcefulness of God. In that statement, we are acknowledging that our Father is resourceful. Why is it important for our Father to be resourceful? Just like it was, for, just like it is for our natural fathers to be resourceful. As children, when we think about our Father, Daddy can do anything. You break your toy, you take it to Daddy, because Daddy can fix it. He might not know how, but the faith that you have in him being able to get it done, that's why you call him Daddy. Yeah. So when it comes to our Heavenly Father, when we say our Father, which art in heaven, we are acknowledging his resourcefulness. And the root of the word Father includes the idea that he is the originator. That is what's so beautiful about the word of God. We may not know what to say. We may not know how to get there. But if you know the, uh, the, uh, the Lord's Prayer, as you recite the prayer, this is what you are affirming. You are affirming that he is resourceful. And you're also affirming that he is the originator. It points to a source, a cause, and a point of origin. God is our source. It all starts with him. I don't care what they taught you in school, in science class about evolution and all these different things. When you say our Father, which art in heaven, you are affirming that he is resourceful and you are affirming that he is the originator. You are affirming that it all began with him. I may not be able to stand up against scientists that, that can give you all this scientific information to tell you contrary. But see, I have a relationship with God, and because of my relationship, I don't care what they say, I don't care how they can prove it, but I know for myself. And since I know for myself, I can boldly stand on that which I know. And what do I know? He's my father. He arts and he is in heaven. He is resourceful. And he is the origin. No, 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 no. It was Darwinism. Or was it? I know for myself. Did you see him do it, Nick? I didn't. How do you know he did it? Because we're in relationship. And that's the beautiful thing about relationship. I don't have to know everything that you've done, Deborah. But when we are come into relationship, when people come and try to tell me something super sideways, I can say no, because I know we're in relationship. 
And the things that I know about her, that doesn't speak about her character. And the thing about relationship is, you can come into a relationship, and this is not telling a lie, but when you are in relationship, even when you don't know, but you know it's contrary to what you know, stand on that. Because then you are affirming to that person, you might have done it, but that's not the you that I know. Amen. That's not the you that I believe that's in. Right. That's not the you that I'm going to profess. So and that is what we do in relationship. When we come into relationship with the Father and we know that he is resourceful and that he is the origin, I don't care how bad you mess up. Our Father, yes. which art in heaven, yes, I know man. for myself. I'm not going to speak to who I am. I'm not going to speak to where I am. I'm going to speak to who he has confirmed and professed me to be because he is the originator. Yes. Now, as the originator and as the source, we understand that he is the source of physical life, but he is also the source of grace and mercy. Amen. The inseparable twins of grace and mercy. There's no need to have grace if there is no mercy. There's no need to have mercy if there is no grace. It's all tied together. He is the originator of life, but he is also the source of our grace and our mercy. See, we're building something here. We're, we're growing something here, okay? And since he is the source of our eternal life, the relationship that we have with him is one that he initiated. He's the creator. He created all of us. Why did he create us? To worship him and to give him all the honor and the glory. So yeah. therefore, the relationship that we are striving to have with him we didn't wake up one day and say, well, you know, I'm just going to follow Jesus today. It's a nice day outside, and the weather's nice, and I don't have anything else to do. I'm going to follow Jesus. Before you even had that inkling of thought in your mind, because he is the originator and the giver of life, because he is our source of grace and mercy, he initiated this relationship long before long you even thought long. about it, because that is how much he yes. loves us. Before you had a chance to do what you did, before you had a chance to say something contrary, before you had a chance to get thrown off track, before you had a chance to deny him, he planted the seed for the relationship. Yes, yes. The world is coming to turn you contrary. Your friends are going to tell you sideways. Life is going to tell you he ain't present. But the relationship was initiated long time ago. As the originator of relationship, every address of God as Father by a person in worship should acknowledge this. When you go into his presence and you're ready to worship him, the first thing you need to thank him for is life in that relationship. He's given you a chance. He put the breath of life in your body. Worship him and thank him and remember that it all began with him. Yes. He didn't say anything about what you did yesterday. He didn't say anything about what you did before you got here. He didn't say anything about what you might be thinking right now. In his presence, worship him. Yes. We were created to worship him. He loved us so much that he initiated a relationship before we even knew who we were. It was all a part of the plan. All a part of the plan. We're, we're, we're filthy, and we ain't going to get it right. He knew what Adam was going to do. He knew what was going to happen. He knew who was going to be in office. He knew, he knew, he knew. But despite knowing, he initiated relationship to prove to us that he is the originator and he is our source, our Father, which art in heaven. This is an affirmation that the relationship that each of us has with him is his work and his creation. He is the originator. When we say our Father, which art in heaven, we're also acknowledging the responsibility of God. We have responsibility, but ultimately, he has responsibility. What this indicates is that God, our heavenly Father, he is the one that is ultimately responsible for us. We may not be able to remember all these things when it's time to go to him in prayer, but that's why he gave us the outline, because when we recite this, we are affirming these things, the responsibility of God, okay? None of us would have dared to push off a responsibility for ourselves onto him, but in the beginning, he made this foundation clear that he is responsible for us. He reveals himself to everyone, and he lets us know that he accepts responsibility for us, and it is not presumptuous for us to bring him both our joy and our needs. 
because he is responsible for us. God, so what I'm, uh, somebody might say, so what you're saying is, even when I'm messing up, he's responsible? Yes, he is. Always. And he wants you to come to him, bring the good stuff, but also bring your needs as well. So don't just tell me, tell him who he is and what he can do. Also let him know what he can do for you in that season. But we begin by giving him the worship and the honor and the glory because then that brings our mind into alignment. And that brings our will into alignment. And that casts some things out that don't need to be in his presence. If we just start off with, I need, I need, I need, I need, your anxiety is present. I need, I need, I need, I need, your worry is present. I need, I need, I need, I need, your, your anger is present. But when we start off acknowledging who he is, that, that anxiety, that depression, that situation, that circumstance, yes, all yes, that has yes, to flee away yes. because there ain't no room for that to dwell That's in the right. place where God is. So we begin by giving him the honor and the glory. We understand that he's resourceful. We understand that he is responsible for us. And this is what he encourages us to do. Yes. And this is what he expects us to do. He's looking for you to come into his presence. He is encouraging you to spend time with him. He's encouraging you to have relationship with him. He's encouraging you to understand that he is responsible for you. He is expecting these things. Mary and Martha, we've said it so many times before, he sat and he cried with them when Lazarus was dead. Why is Jesus crying when he knows the resurrection is coming? Because he wanted them to understand, you're going through it, and I understand so when you're praying to me, don't just think that you're praying to somebody that has no clue. I understand. Yes. But I also know the resurrection is coming. Mm -hmm. So that's why I want you to bring your cares to me. That's why I want you to bring your concern to me. Because you can only see what's in front of you, but I can see what's on the horizon. So bring it to me. Let's have a few seconds of pity party, but we're going to get beyond that because I know what I can do. So we, we come scared. Come hurt, come with your anxiety, but understand that those things have to take second place because he is resourceful and he also is responsible. When we say our Father, which art in heaven, we're also referring to the responsiveness of God, okay? We understand by his title that he is responsive. To address God as Father is to affirm that he is uh, responsive with God's love to those whom he loves. When you, when you reach to him, he reaches back to you. He is responsive. Now, does he always answer in the moment? He doesn't. But he all, when he answers, is perfect for your time and your situation. So when you come to him, knowing that he is a responsive God, you've got to give him a perfected praise. And what that perfected praise is, is I don't see the answer right now, but I know that you can do it. So I'm praising you like I already have it because he is moved by our faith. He knows you don't see it. He knows you don't have it. But he wants you to acknowledge that you know that he can and he will. Yes. Okay? So we have to also, when we think about this, we have to think about the helpful word that he gave to Thomas. He said to Thomas, he that has seen me have seen the Father because he is responsive. That's the kind of God we serve. It is safe to assume that God is just as responsive to our needs as Jesus is to everyone that he met. No one met Jesus with the need and left the same way they came. You don't have to come into his presence and leave his presence as you entered the room, as you came into the situation. He says, come broken. He says, come with your heart and bring these things. But when you get into his presence, you lay those things at his feet so that your hands are free to receive that which he has for you. You can't receive for the Father if you're holding on to what you brought into his presence. So lay your petitions at his feet. Give him the honor, the glory, and the praise, and then let him know what it is that you are standing in need of. He that has seen me have seen the Father. Okay? So if you read the Gospels with discernment, you'll be reassured that Jesus was always accessible and responsive. 
when the lady reached for the hem of his garment. She didn't get a lot. She just got the hem. Now, how can the hem be enough to heal? Because she had faith. She knew his power. Yes. She knew what it took. <clears throat> but look at the method by which she went to him. She didn't stand up and yell and wave her hands and say, come to me. She crawled through the crowd. Yes. Because we've got to be in a posture to receive the promise. Get low when you go to him. Because it's not about me and it's not about you. But you got to acknowledge who he is and find your way into his presence because he is accessible and he is responsive. Our Father, which art in heaven. We must know that God is our Father and he is in heaven. Okay? The phrase that the Lord added to our Father is very significant. It reveals some things about the God we pray to and things that we need to know if we are going to pray confidently. We have to know where he is and who he is. Don't look for him down here and find him here. He ought in heaven. By acknowledging that he is in heaven, what you are in turn acknowledging is the fact that it's not about here, it's not about what you're going through, but build your hope on the things that are eternal. Okay? We must also know his position. First, Jesus is saying that our Father is in heaven, and there's surely an affirmation for us that God is separate from the earthly fathers and their personalities, okay? There is a distinction, and there is a separation. Acknowledge your earthly father, but also remember your heavenly father. And when we are doing this, okay, because our prayers are not to be addressed to our, spirit, to our physical fathers, but to our spiritual father. And secondly, what this is doing, we're acknowledging that our God is a sovereign God. It's not about me. It's not about you. But it's about who he is, and it's about where he resides. And also in doing this, we must acknowledge his power. Our earthly fathers dwell in our earthly homes. There's an address for this house, and we know where to find it, and there's a condition to this house. Some are nice, and some are not, but our Heavenly Father dwells in heaven. And by affirming these things, we are laying the foundation for our prayer. And when we lay the foundation for our prayer, this is what helps us to pray the way that we need to pray so that we can receive that which we are looking to receive. So in conclusion, this month we're going to continue to focus on the Lord's Prayer. We're going to understand who He is. We want to understand the power, and we want to understand the way in which we approach the throne of grace. Let us stand together. Amen. Now, we thank God for what he's doing through this, this series and through these lessons and through this understanding. Not just a father, but our father. Amen? So the doors of the church are open.